Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the second session of our Critical Access Hospital Virtual Conference, Region E. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you for coming back if you were here with us for the first session. Um, today we're gonna be talking with my colleagues, Carla Wilbur, Christy Bishop and Keith Bubbleo about survey readiness. And with that, I will turn you over to Carla, Christy, and Keith. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you guys for joining us today. My name is Carla Wilbur. I am a principal at Stroudwater and have been with the firm for almost 10 years. I'm a doctoral prepared nurse, and so my work with Stroudwater has been in, um, primarily in clinical and clinical operations. Um, I'm glad that you all are with us today, and I'll turn it over to Christy for introduction. Thanks, Carla. I'm Christy Bishop. Um, I've been with Straw Water just a little over two years, and I'm a consultant with them. Um, prior to my experience with Straw Water, I'm a master's prepared nurse, and I've worked in various roles in a, a hospital setting, and I'm glad to be here with you today to discuss uh, survey readiness. And I'm going to hand this over to Keith, one of my colleagues. Hello, everyone. I'm Keith Bubbleo. I've uh, been with Stroudwater for over 20 years now, and I'm a senior data analyst. And uh, my job is to take some of the information, uh, interesting information uh, that goes into survey uh, readiness and uh, display it. Um, and I'll be showing uh, a dashboard later on uh, in the presentation that shows some of that data um, and how it relates to the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, presentation today. So thank you for uh, joining us. Thanks, Keith. Mm -hmm. All right, so we will get started. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, you guys are automatically muted. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, um, please uh, you know, put it in the chat function, or we will have time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Um, all of these sessions are being recorded, and the slides and recordings will be made available to you all after the webinar. Um, there will also be a short survey following the um, webinar. Um, we really uh, want to know how we're doing, um, and it can help us improve if you'll take that survey for us. That would be great. And a little bit about Stroudwater. For those of you who may not know us, um, we are a healthcare consulting firm. Um, our home office is in Portland, Maine. Um, we have a long history working with um, rural hospitals, community hospitals, and different systems and physician groups. And there's just a little bit about the services that we offer. That's not all-encompassing, but that gives you a pretty good idea. This map shows you um, the different um, organizations, our clients that we have um, been working with since 2017. So there are many, many more, but this just gives you an idea of the, um, the breadth of our work um, across the country since 2017. We also have a, um, an arm of Stroudwater, which is called Stroudwater Capital Partners. And the Capital Partners Group helps with assessing and the financial um, aspects of um, a um, healthcare organization. So, if you're looking for a new facility or facility um, planning work and um, the financing for that, this is the group that you will look for. Thank you. All right, now a little bit about survey readiness. So today what we're gonna do is define survey readiness, um, review the types of CMS surveys, understand how your surveyor is preparing before they come on site or your surveying team. Um, and then um, Keith's gonna help us look at some of the state um, and regional uh, 2567 survey deficiency data on a um, dashboard that he has developed. Um, and then we'll go through some um, tools to help you prepare your survey readiness toolbox. So survey readiness um, is achieving and maintaining an ongoing prepared state in which an organization can confidently ensure compliance with regulatory requirements, patient safety, and quality standards. 
it's always key to um, a good survey is to be survey readiness, continual survey readiness. Why is that important for us? It really impacts the health and safety of our patients, caregivers, and staff. And there are huge financial considerations for our facilities as well. As you can see, we have, um, as of February of 24, um, a total of uh, 67.1 million individuals enrolled in Medicare. Um, and this is a little dated schematic, but it was a really interesting article from Joint Commission that had estimated that by 2030, there will be 80 million or so individuals that are Medicare beneficiaries. And so it's really important for our hospitals that are um, that serve Medicare um, patients that they are survey ready because this could have a huge impact to your organization if you are cited for certain deficiencies. So the types of uh, surveys um, that CMS um, delivers are what are known as certification surveys, validation surveys, revisit surveys, and then complaint surveys. And I will um, give you the um, definitions straight from uh, CMS around what those surveys are. So the certification surveys include both your initial certification and your recertification surveys. And CMS describes those as the surveys are to determine if a prospective or current participant in Medicare and Medicaid meets all the applicable requirements for participation and to evaluate their performance and effectiveness of that participant's care. That's for your certification and recertification surveys. Then you have validation surveys. And validation surveys are used to validate the performance of an accrediting organization. So um, that would be such as I've listed there, there are four. CMS approved accrediting organizations for critical access hospitals, um, ACHC, the Joint Commission, um, the Center for Improvement in Healthcare Quality, and DNV. Um, and so this validation survey uh, validates the performance of that accrediting organization and to make sure that all the requirements um, that, that they may have met all the requirements to participate in Medicare. Um, the CMS selects the providers or suppliers for validation surveys on a random basis. So we have you have no way of really knowing um, if this validation survey um, on your crediting organization will be for you. Um, one note to, um, to point out is that CMS announced in February a proposed rule to strengthen the oversights of these accrediting organizations. And specifically, um, that was around holding the accredi accrediting organizations accountable to the same standards as your state survey agencies, um, and to ensure that these accrediting organizations remain independent reviewers um, by addressing any conflicts of interest and making sure that they place certain limitations on fee-based consulting services that the AOs provide, uh, preventing those accrediting organizations' conflict of interest by prohibiting accrediting organizations' owners, surveyors, or other employees and immediate family from participating in the surveys or having input into the survey results. Um, also, they wanted to make sure that they address potential and actual conflicts of interest by requiring these accrediting organizations to report specific information to CMS about how they will monitor, prevent, and handle conflicts of interest. Um, also, they want to improve the accrediting uh, organization's performance um, by requiring the um, AOs with poor performance to submit a publicly reported correction plan to CMS. So they really want to improve the consistency and standardization of the surveys nationwide and make sure that they're aligning these AO surveys uh, activity 
um, with those that um, are such as the training that's given to the surveying agencies for CMS. So that's about your validation survey. A revisit survey is one in which the survey team reevaluates a specific deficient area. So this is where you were um, cited during a certification um, survey or during a, a sub, uh, substantiated complaint survey. So the revisit survey just verifies that these previously cited deficiencies have been corrected. So a complaint survey, and that's definitely something that none of us want to have, is conducted after the complaint is filed, um, which is an allegation of noncompliance with the federal or state requirements or both. Um, these can be conducted by the state survey agencies or um, by the applicable CMS location, by an approved state program or state licensure program, or by an accrediting organization, the AO. Um, and then investigation into a complaint may or may not result in an on-site survey. It depends on what the complaint actually is. Full surveys, your certification and validation surveys are always full surveys um, that assess the, in, the entire entity's compliance with all of your conditions of participation. So generally your complaint surveys and revisit surveys are more of a focused um, survey, but yet once they are there, if they are there to on a complaint survey or a revisit survey, um, the, um, the, if there are findings that warrant it, this can be expanded. Um, so don't ever think that just because they're there for a more focused survey, this can't be broadened. It, it definitely can. So how does the surveyor prepare? So our surveyors review information about your hospital. Specifically, um, one thing that's important to note is they review if there are specific, you know, special features um, with uh, your hospital. Um, do you have any provider-based or off-campus departments or remote locations? Because if so, um, the um, survey team needs to, um, they will need to survey any of the remote locations um, that have um, surgeries um, or inpatient services. Um, if you have remote locations, um, off-campus locations, and they don't um, have inpatient services like the psychiatric or uh, rehabilitative, um, then they will choose um, one off-campus location for inspection. So it's important to note that that can be part of your survey as well. Um, the surveyor will also look at any of your prior um, application forms. They definitely look at your prior survey results and your plan of correction, uh, licensure records, media reports, any type of things that, that are seen on Facebook, and then your organization's website um, as well. Um, the surveyors uh, prepare for different observations, interviews, and record reviews. So their observations are things that they will um, maybe see and observe while they're touring your facility. They can conduct interviews with patients, staff, and then sometimes patients, family members, our caregivers, and then reviewing um, the patient's records that you have um, and policy and procedure records. Um, I have a couple of examples of some things that actually came straight from CMS. So in this situation during a survey or a survey had, surveyor had noticed damaged blood pressure machine. So they interviewed the nursing staff and the nursing staff had uh, revealed that that machine malfunctioned often and had been broken many times in the past few months um, and the staff you know, were kept from using it. Um, one of the nurses tells the surveyor that the staff had submitted multiple requests for it to be fixed, but no one seemed to be working on the issue. So in this particular situation, the surveyor would most likely ask for equipment, maintenance records, stickers, and tracking system 
um, as well as that facilities maintenance request log. So this is something that can block, you know, bloom a bit from just the observation um, that the surveyor made. Another, um, this is during an interview. So during the survey, a surveyor decides to interview a patient regarding a fall. Um, and then the surveyor um, conversation may go something like uh, the surveyor saying, you fell out of bed on Wednesday. Is that correct? And then the patient being interviewed says, yes, it is. And then the surveyor may ask, would you tell me a little more about how that happened? So the surveyors will use close-ended and open-ended questions. Um, and depending on what that surveyor finds during the interview, the surveyor may ask for staffing records, call bell logs, fall risk policies, and other data and information in a situation like this. In another um, example, during the survey, a surveyor reviews a facility incident log and finds that several reports of medication errors related to antibiotics. So two of the errors were not caught in time and caused harm to the patients. So while the surveyor is at the facility, they conduct interviews with the pharmacy and with staff who were involved in patient care. And during those interviews, the surveyor learns that the pharmacy was using a new label and barcode system, but the staff claimed they weren't trained on how to read the new labels prior to implementation. So given this situation, the surveyor would probably review the medication administration policies and training records. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about 2567 deficiencies. So a statement of deficiency, the statement of deficiency data um, is actually available for skilled nursing facilities, nursing facilities, hospitals, and critical access hospitals. Um, the reason they call it 2567 is that is the number that is associated with the official document that is used. It's called Form CMS 2567, Statement of Deficiencies and Plans of Correction. So the state surveyors, um, when they conduct their surveyors of um, the acute hospitals, critical access hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, um, they're assessing compliance with um, Medicare health and safety regulations. So all of your COPs. So they prepare their re um, survey report on an electronic version of this form um, 2567. Um, and then that helps to support the survey work. So in that electronic system, the surveyor will add the text um, of the, uh, the system contains all the text on this particular regulation, and then it breaks it down into what we call tags. And that helps the, um, the surveyor identify the specific regulatory deficiencies um, that they would need to speak to um, based on that particular survey. So the um, system generates that form with the text associated um, and then the surveyors have a summary of all of that evidence of noncompliance. And then the survey report um, is released to the hospital. Um, and then um, the form, um, if, if required, um, the form is then uh, returned with that. It's a plan of correction for each area of deficiency. So there are two different types of citations that CMS can issue. That's a standard level deficiency, which means the hospital may be out of compliance with one part of that regulation, but it's less severe. Um, and then the more serious um, is called the condition level. And that means that the hospital is in substantial, uh, is not in substantial compliance with that COP. So um, that's not what we want to have. And then the additional level of noncompliance, which is called immediate jeopardy. Um, and that's when surveyors determine that the hospital's uh, deviation from those regulatory standards co constitutes an immediate threat to patients' health and sa uh, safety. So 
Um, immediate jeopardy forces the hospital to correct those underlying problems quickly or they can be terminated um, from uh, participation in Medicare and Medicaid. So I am going to turn this over now to Keith, who is going to show us the dashboard that he's created with the 2567 deficiencies. Uh, thank you very much, Carla. So, yes, as Carla said, this is uh, public data that's available from CMS, the 2567 uh, form uh, data. It's a downloadable Excel uh, file. Um, and it has data it for deficiencies uh, from 2017 through Q1 of 2024. Um, what we wanted to do is just kind of take that data and put it into a dashboard uh, to show, um, you know, what this um, kind of how this looks on a nation nationwide scale. Um, what we did is we uh, limited this to just data for 2021 through 2023, uh, just for those years. Uh, and why we did that is because um, the schedules, the survey schedules are on a three to four year schedule. Um, what we wanted to do is show that these are um, these are the, the deficiencies that are uh, the surveys that were in this past couple of years. Uh, so these would be coming due again to, to read uh, survey within the next uh, in 2024, 2025 and 2026. So um, the uh, let me just run through the, the dashboard here. So what we're looking at is the overall data. We've got the um, uh, the, the map of the United States. Um, and this is in Tableau. If anybody's familiar with using Tableau, everything is filterable here. Um, and it gives you kind of a, a quick highlight of what's going on. So within the the, the United States um, in these years, uh, we've had 2,115 hospitals with any deficiency um, and a total deficiency because there can be multiple, multiple deficiencies, multiple surveys, um, total deficiency of over 16,400. Um, uh, the data is broken out by hospital type, so this is only looking at hospitals, not the other um, the other facilities, just hospitals. So we've got critical access hospitals. Um, uh, those are your, you know your standard uh, twenty five bed uh, cause. Um, other rural hospitals are hospitals that are that are not critical access but are found within a rural area, um, and then we have uh, the non rural hospitals. So you can see the breakout on the bottom of the bar here. So 587 critical access hospitals had deficiencies in this time period. Um, uh the on the left below will show the uh the description of the de deficiencies um just kind of the the description deficiency uh not the actual tag number that's there's some more detail in there behind this um so um you know of these total hospitals um let's filter by uh hospital t uh here so we can see that the medical screening exam uh was the highest one uh, so each of these table, these, the, the, these, uh, charts are interactive and we're looking at region, uh, E here. So let's, uh, take a look at say Washington. I'm going to filter just on Washington and we can get an idea of what's going on there. Uh, so again, within that time period, you've got, uh, uh, 57 hospitals with deficiencies of those 29 of them were critical access hospitals, uh, for a total of 691. Um, and then, um, in the table here, we'll show you the, the 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 descriptions. So as you scroll down, you can see how many uh, how many were were, were showed up. Uh, what the top ones were for Washington uh, was infection prevention and control, patient care policies. Um, as far as the total number of hospitals, um, then if we wanted to filter, uh, say on the total deficiencies, uh, 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 it was patient care policies in the the QA uh, PI. Um, some of these are filterable as well if you wanted to click on just critical access hospitals in Washington and see what the totals were for those types of hospitals of those 29. Um, uh, uh, again, you can further filter, see what the, the the total number of hospitals and then the total deficiencies as well uh, to look at kind of the top, you know, the top 10 deficiencies. Um, clicking through, um, if you wanted to, you can also select, um, you know, uh, critical access hospitals and other rural hospitals together. Um, it's very nice and interactive. I'm going to switch out here. Um, another thing we can look at is let's look at all critical access, critical, critical access hospitals in the country, um, or by other rural hospitals. Um, and you can see that the, 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 the different types will, uh, will filter, uh, based on what you select. That uh, one other thing you can do is if you wanted to see what the total, um, 
uh, for the different types of, of, of deficiencies here. If we want to click on, say, nursing services, this is filterable as well, and it'll give you the total numbers uh, for each of those. So, you know, you can look in your state, kind of see what's going on. Um, where this data is available uh, for you all to look at. I'm going to get out of my uh, share screen here. We have this now on a, um, uh, a web page um, that Stroudwater has put together with a little bit of information about our survey readiness process. Um, I'm going to drop this link in the chat once I'm finished here, uh, but you'll get some information about, about this, what we're talking about today, um, a little bit, and then the dashboard is right there. Um, some other things to talk about this, uh, uh, as Carla, I think had mentioned, this doesn't include the deficiencies from the, uh, the, the other accrediting organizations. This is just the publicly available ones through CMS. Um, those other deficiencies are not available to the public. Um, and there is additional detail in this data, uh, you know, behind this data, the, the, the data that's creating this dashboard, um, that Carla is going to talk about now, including, um, the hospital details. So the actual, you know, the name of the hospital, the, um, the date of the sur of the survey, uh, the type of deficiency, including the deficiency tag, and then all of the, t the text um, uh, uh, describing what that deficiency is. So I'm going to pop this into the chat right now uh, for everyone to take a look. Um, see if that's available to everybody. Hillary, if that's not, can you share that with uh, with the rest of the people? It's showing up, Keith. Is it showing up? Okay. All right. Great. Okay. So uh, that's the link. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I will uh, turn it back over to Carla to talk about some of the detail. All right. Great. Thank you, Keith. And we'll go back to that. All right, you guys should be back to the yep. we are screen. Here. I'm gonna turn this over to Christy. Great, thank you, Carla. And we have, we're, it looks good. I see it up here just fine. Great. So you're looking at the top 10 um, deficiencies for our rural and call, er, excuse me, call areas. Uh, our tags are uh, KTAG 0335, three, uh, the spark, sparklers, sprinkler sparkles. We all like sparkles, right? Uh, sprinkler systems, uh, maintenance and testing, a uh, total of 199 deficiencies. Um, and then we have KTAG. Uh, well, actually, if you just take a quick look, you can see the total of deficiencies here. And I'll go over each of those tags and the details and the deficiencies um, in more depth as we go through the slides. That make it a little easier for you guys to keep up. But it just, you know, just is really interesting when you're looking at the total deficiencies here. There's a significant amount and it's, you know, you want to make sure that you're on top of these. So, Carla, if you don't mind switching the uh, slide, that would be great. So KTAG K353, which is the sprinkler system, the automatic lift sprinkler um, and um, sand pipe systems are inspected and tested and maintained in accordance of N5PA25. Uh, standard for inspection, testing, and maintaining of the water-based protect fire protection systems. Records of the system's design, maintenance, and inspection, and testing are maintained and secured in a secured location and ready for you guys and available for when they come on for uh, them to look at. So you want to make sure that your, dated, your date of the sprinkler system is listed and checked, uh, who the provider of the last system um, check was, and the water system supply source. Uh, some of the citations that come with this particular tag are if the sprinkler system heads are damaged in any way, um, have, have you painted over top of them? Sometimes the fins on the sprinkler system get bent or they get pushed into the wall uh, due to accidents or you know unforeseen events in our area. So doing regular maintenance on your sprinkler system is really important. Uh, slide, please. Uh, so KTAG uh, 918, um, the electrical systems, um, the essential electrical system, the generator, or the alternate power source associated with equipment is capable of supplying service to within 10 seconds of power failure. If the 10 sec second criteria is not met during the monthly test, a process should be followed up to provide an annual confirmation 
that it is capable of life safety and critical branches. Maintenance and testing of the generator and transfer switch switches should be performed in accordance of the NFPA 110. Generator sets are inspected weekly, exercised overload uh, 30 minutes, um, 12 times at least a year, and in a 20 to 40 day intervals. Exercises should um, once every 36 months and continuous of four hours. Um, scheduled tests under the load, oops, sorry, under load conditions in, include complete um, simulation, cold standard start, and automatic or manual transfers of all EES loads and are conducted by a competent by your competent personnel. Maintenance is tested in stored energy power sources are accordance of the NFPA 111. May, the main and feeder circuit breakers um, are inspected annually and performed periodic, periodically exercised to make sure that it is competent and established according to manufacturer's requirements. Um, written uh, records of maintenance and testing are required and readily available. Um, e the electric panels and circuits um, marked and readily in, um, in, in identifiable when they're on site, minimal and possible, any possible damage of emergency power sources is designed and considered um, for new installations. Um, citations for this particular K-tag are engines showing that there's an oil leak or um, current or a coolant leak or missing inspection documentation. So it's so important when you're doing these testings that you're marking um, how that test went, whether it failed or it, or it was a good test, and you want to have that documentation upon that um, CMS or um, your surveyor's request. Another thing I would suggest having is the owner's manual of your generator, because uh, they might have you refer to that when they're questioning you. Um, slide, please. So uh, K321, uh, hazardous areas and closures. Hazardous areas are protected in coordinates of 18.3.2.1. The area shall be enclosed with a one hour fire rating barrier with a three quarter hour fire rate door with windows in accordance of 8.71.1. The door shall be self-closed and automatic closed in accordance of 7.2.1.8. Hazardous areas are protected by a sprinkler system in accordance of the 9.7 um, and 18.2.3.2.1 and 8.4. Um, describe the, the door. So these locations of the doors like the broiler room, um, heater room floors, laundry areas, uh, repair and ma maintenance shops um, where you have supplies such as paint, soiled linen areas, um, trash collection rooms, any storage that you're your are, co are combustible, um, and, and lavatories. Uh, sightings, for example, for this particular one is that a laundry chute, um, they had an active laundry chute, and when they were throwing bags down, that actually um, someone had opened the door, a laundry bag had fallen in front of the door, and the door was not able to close. Um, Another one I would like to speak to, which we've all probably experienced at some time, is propping the doors open. So we don't want to use any door stops to make those doors open and stay open for any long periods of time. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so our C-tag is 1208, Infection Prevention Surveillance Controlling of HIAs. Uh, the infection prevention and control includes surveillance prevention and control of HIAs, including and in maintaining clean and sanitary environments to avoid any sources or transmission of infection. And the program also addresses any infection control identifies uh, by public health authorities, which is your, um, your um, excuse me, um, health departments. And if there's anything going on there, um, you, you wanna make sure that your program is robust and you're tracking any type of um, infections that you have in your area in like surgical area and what are we doing to prevent those? Or if we do have a high infection rate, what are our um, what does our measures look like? And how are we trying to prevent them in the future? And are we making progress there? So, and we also want to make sure that our policies are following what our infection control 
um, measures are, and they often look at um, hand washing for one is a big one that they do too when they come on site. Um, so K712 fire drills. Uh, fire drills include an uh, tra transmission of a fire alarm signal and simulation of a fire emergency condition. The fire drill is held at an unexpected time under very, various uh, conditions, at least quarterly of each shift. What that means is most of your staff are not aware that you're going to have this fire alarm. The staff are familiar with procedures um, and they are competent to know what to do when um, a fire uh, drill is is in routine, responsibly uh, planning and conducting the drills assigned only for competent persons and who are qualified to exercise that leadership of the drill. Where the drills are conducted are between 9 and 6 a.m. and code of the announcement may be um, used instead of an audible alarm. So tracking of regular fire drills and often who attends them and how they go is something that they will ask for when they are on site. Uh, next slide, please. So CTAG 1206, Infection Prevention Control and Policies. Infection uh, Prevention Control Pro and Control Program is documented in policies and procedures, employees' methods and prevention and controlling the transmission of infections within the CA and between the CA and other health care healthcare settings. So when we have our policies, um, we want to make sure that they are um, updated on an annual basis and that we're following them. Oftentimes they find these these uh, policies and our procedures that we're doing on the floor don't meet what our policy says. So be sure that you're looking at your policies and um, comparing to what you're doing um, on the floor or in the department that the policy, policy resides. Uh, so CTAG 0914 maintenance, the CA has housekeeping and prevention maintenance programs to ensure that all essential mechanical, electrical, and patient care equipment is maintained and operated in conditioning. Um, oftentimes they'll come in and pull um, some of your equipment and there's no maintenance um, care on it or um, they're not seeing any time of when um, that when that last um, maintenance or excuse me when it was last time maintenance so you want to make sure that you have um, your housekeeping and maintenance um, policies and procedures and how you're maintaining your equipment up to date and you're following that um, as well. Uh, slide, please. Uh, CTAG <clears throat> 1017, patient care policies. The rule for storage and handling um, and administrating of drugs and biologicals. The rules must provide that the drug storage areas that is administered and accordance to accepting professional uh, principles and current and accurate records of keeping receipt of any um, disposal or scheduled drugs and updated, mislabeled, or other use, un, unused drugs are not available for patient use. So how are we storing our medications? Um, are we, is it behind a locked room? How are we disposing them? Are we disposing our medications safely? With, um, and are we documenting that appropriately? Um, doing audits on how we're disposing our medication is um, highly recommended. And then having that process to show when the, when the state survey comes in is also important to have too. So KTAG 345, fire alarm system, testing and maintenance. Um, the fire alarm system is tested and maintained in accordance of an approved program complying with requirements NFPA 70, um, National Electric Code, um, and NFP 72, National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code. Records of the system, acceptance and maintenance testing are ready and available when that surveyor comes on up. Um, they want to make sure that you're able to provide any sensitivity testing that shows whether that um, the alarm has passed or failed your testing. So having that record available when your surveyor comes on is something they will ask for. Um, so uh, ATAG 2400 compliance with uh, 489.24 is special responsibilities, Medicare hospitals, emergency cases on Antella. Um, according to um, Jerry, Jerry Berry, Specialist of Principal CMS Joint Commission Resource. One of the areas in which the healthcare facilities are most found lacking in this survey. Um, and I, we have some really great examples on the next couple slides of this Antella, if you don't mind, Carla. So 
Uh, Hospital A um, had a failure to provide adequate medical screening, examination, and stabilizing treatment. So we had a 34-year-old male with chest pain and shortness of breath who presented to the ED accompanied by his girlfriend. The patient requested to see, the, see a physician and he became belligerent with the nurse and, and uh, nurse asked why they led the patient um, being escorted out of the ED by security. Several minutes later, the patient returned to the ED with his uh, within the girlfriend's truck. Uh, she told the staff that he had had a seizure. Then uh, she was informed by the staff that they would not help this patient and get him out of the truck. In addition, the security guard told her that she had to leave. Then the patient's girlfriend had taken him to another hospital and that's where he was pronounced dead within 20 minutes of arrival to that next hospital. Um, hospital B, failure to stabilize an emergency medical condition. So we have a 58-year-old uh, patient who presented into the ED with blurred vision and dizziness. After falling and providing an appropriate EMC, uh, um, an ED nurse directed the patient to a local eye doctor and failed to provide that medical treatment to stabilize the patient. Um, and that patient ended up having a cerebral um, infarction. Um, so we definitely missed the mark there. Uh, hospital C, an off-duty volunteer at the hospital presented to the ED and told the ED staff at triage he was nauseated and felt like he was going to throw up. He hoped that it would be able to get into a room quickly. The ER was um, nearly empty. His wife and son visited the triage desk repeatedly and over the next two hours, he lost the ability to speak or respond to any questions. His breathing became very labored. During the trip to the bathroom, he was his legs buckled and he needed support from his wife who yelled help, um, I can't hold him up. And he um, pounded on the wall, was separate to the bathroom of the triage. No one came, um, so his son dialed 911 asking if he could take his dad to a different ER. Since the operator told the son that they couldn't pick um, him up at the ER, suggested that his dad go to the parking lot so paramedics could pick him up. The wife and son did not, <clears throat> excuse me, did just that and took the man to the back seat of the car. Paramedics arrived, realized that he was too sick to be transferred and took him inside um, the ambulance entrance where the ER personnel began to jump into action. An hour after the ER st staff performed CPR and the man died. These are all examples of um, tele violations um, and just something to think about when we are bringing our patients into our ER and how we are treating them and recognizing their symptoms. Um, so I'm gonna, um, using the data, I'm gonna address the uh, top deficiencies in specific area and region. Um, so this provides a great insight of the area that you guys are in um, and non-compliance areas. Uh, can, it can help you prioritize the efforts and put, ad address some of the potential gaps and barriers within your own facility will also help you identify and be more proactive and prevent and mitigate any of these proficiencies, deficiencies before the surveyor comes to your facility. So just having this information allows you to take it back and really dig in to see where you're at as far as the deficiencies that we're showing you today. And it allows you to train um, and focus on the areas that I identify today here and if there's any non-compliance for you and develop a great action plan to address any of the specific deficiencies that you might have and um, and make sure that you're overall compliant throughout the hospital with those. Slide. And so now I will turn this over to Ms. Carla. Thanks, Christy. All right, a little bit about building your toolbox. Um, so this, um, we have developed six key tools basically to kind of help you build that toolbox so that you are always survey ready. Um, and I'll go through each of these. Um, we want to uh, utilize your past survey and plan a correction, um, maintain a, a, a document checklist and assign owners, develop a revolving calendar uh, by month for your policy uh, and procedure reviews and revisions, and then conduct internal tracers um, with multidisciplinary teams, um, creating a daily checklist um, that to be managed, and then um, hopefully designing and printing a pocket guide for your staff so they can be better prepared. 
So utilizing your past survey uh, plan of correction. So um, this just shows you a regulation um, regarding a um, 485.635D3 that has to do with drugs and biologics and IV medications being administered under the supervision and with orders and so forth and by acceptable standards of practice. So in this particular case, and this is actually a survey, um, a survey result, the standard was not met. Um, and based on the document review, observation and interview um, that the surveyor did, the facility had not adhered to the protocol used for administering an aerosol generating treatment. Um, so the plan of correction was established that we needed some additional education on the proper administration of this th uh, aerosol therapy. And to ensure that ongoing compliance, there was an audit process to make sure that, the, um, that this was being followed and then how the audit was gonna be done um, for so many months, six months or longer, achieving that 100% compliance. Um, and then the audit results would be reported to the chief nursing officer. So in this particular case, the surveyor came in prior to the survey, they're gonna look at your plan of correction and make sure that you did have that additional education that you did have an audit process to make sure that um, that this aerosol therapy was being administered appropriately. So that's another place for you to look for areas that you need to make sure that you are compliant when a before your survey. Another one, and Christy mentioned on a couple of occasions, fire alarm system um, and maintenance. In this situation, it was the testing and maintenance um, the finding uh, on document review and interview um, that the facility had not ensured that the fire alarm system was tested annually at this particular clinic. Um, and so their plan of correction was uh, to prevent the reoccurrence. They established a planned event alert in their maintenance system schedule. And then one month before the due date, the maintenance staff would get a reminder uh, for that inspection. And then they were also going to explore a change in some vendors uh, and a vendor. So they would um, begin a compliance audit. Again, the surveyor will look at your, um, your survey, your survey results and your plan of correction and make sure that you did um, put in place what your plan of correction said. This is another one that had to do with um, construction of walls and it's a corridor regulation. Um, this again was during a, a surveyor's observation and interview um, that they found that the facility had not maintained all corridor walls within a minimum one hour fire resistant rating um, and the plan of correction was put in place. Um, they initiated a bi-monthly above the ceiling inspection process and they um, also initiated a compliance audit. Um, this is another one that had to do with doors. During the observation, the surveyors found uh, that in the corridor leading to a skilled, uh, skilled nursing facility, um, that the right leaf of the fire rated um, cross corridor door didn't fully close um, when allowed to swing from the fully open position. So um, the doors uh, had been, their plan of correction was the doors had been placed on a bi-monthly inspection schedule and when those were going to be begin and that audits would continue. So um, you can bet that the surveyors would look to make sure that there was a bi-monthly inspection schedule and that the um, inspections were audited. Another one had to do with smoke barriers. Um, they had found during observation that again, above the um, uh, drop ceiling uh, in front of the main hospital elevator, there was some wires. Um, and then another observation on the second floor that had to do with drop ceilings. And so um, their plan of correction was to ensure that on uh, ongoing compliance, they would do the bi-monthly above the ceiling inspection. Um, and then their audits would be reported to their facilities management director. 
and then they would be educating their staff um, as well. So this, again, surveyors will go back to this plan of correction and make sure all of that has been done. Now we'll talk about maintaining a document checklist. Um, one thing that you can do as part of your toolbox to maintain your survey readiness is to um, divide all of the different documents um, and things that you will need for the surveyors into different categories and assign an owner to each category. Um, this is not all encompassing, just some examples, um, maybe a category of general organizational detail, um, another category of meeting minutes and reports, um, then plans and policies, different contracted services. There have been a, there's been a lot of chatter um, from on the survey front on contracted services, different logs that you would need, and then different um, measurement data and KPIs and so forth. So example, you would have one person that's responsible for meeting minutes and reports, and they would be able to have at their fingertips or either already collected um, and keep up to date these med exec meeting minutes, PNT meeting minutes, board meeting minutes, the quality committee minutes, um, fire drill documentation and different evaluations, your infection prevention and antibiotic stewardship um, reports and minutes. And so this particular person would have ownership of keeping up with and making sure that when the surveyor comes in and asks for these particular items, these documents, that we have that owner of those documents and they would be readily available. This really takes the burden off of one or two individuals to have everything at their fingertips. So if you have your survey readiness team and have it, um, these different documents divided into categories, assigning that owner to each category, you can have this information more readily available. The next is to develop that revolving calendar for your policy and procedure review and revision. So again, div uh, dividing this into logical categories and departments, possibly just an example again, maybe you have um, human resources in January, environment of care, different policies and procedures in February, information management in March, and so forth and so on. And it may be that one department needs, um, you know, two months, but have a um, have your policies and procedures um, uh, in a revolving calendar of some sort so that it is, you know, you have the logical categories and the calendared items. An example for this one was medication management, possibly in May, um, we may want to have the uh, you know policies like acceptable medication orders, medication administration processes, um, disposal of expired medications, wasting of narcotics. Ensure that your review and revision dates are um, on your policies, that you have the appropriate signatures, and updated references. Um, in a couple of different survey, uh, mock survey projects that we've been involved in, um, we will have these updated policies that we review and they're done very well. And they're, um, uh, they contain exactly what they need. But then when you look at the reference, the reference is old. And so if you're using a nationally recognized reference, then we want to make sure that that uh, reference is up to date. It needs to be as up to date as that nationally recognized, maybe professional standard, whatever their latest revision is. Um, so always go back and check those as well. The next is conducting your internal tracers. So you can do this as an interdisciplinary team. Um, and this will help you take a, a targeted approach um, and, and, and assess that compliance with regulatory standards and then look at your areas for improvement. So a tracer uh, follows the path of patient care from the admission to discharge 
Um, it evaluates policies and procedures that were necessary during that uh, path of patient care. Um, it helps you really understand how your policies basically are being translated into practice. So for instance, I'll refer back to the plan of correction on the aerosol medication. If you were involved in a tracer and you saw that this patient had received aerosol medication, you would look at that policy or um, what you have in place for aerosol medications. Do your nurses refer to a specific um, guideline on aerosol, um, on the initiation of aerosol therapy? Do you have an order and so forth? So you, during a tracer, you um, will look at all of the different areas to see how the, that it has been translated into practice. This can help you identify your gaps in, um, in your compliance and in patient safety. Um, and in many cases in your staff safety as well, um, it helps you to promote staff engagement and accountability. Hopefully, your tracer team includes um, staff members as well um, so that they can see how this actually works. And it can give you um, actionable insights for improvement into um, these different areas. So your, as an example, your leadership may select tracers monthly. And this may be based on your high-risk areas. Sentinel events or regulatory focus. Maybe you want to do uh, uh, tracers on your last plan of correction. Um, your team uh, observes the patient care processes, interactions with staff, um, documentation, your protocol adherence, everything in real time. So it's tracing again that patient's path of patient care. Um, your team then documents the findings, and then your team and key team me members review those findings and develop your action plans, your actionable steps for corrective action on what you found um, in your tracers, and these should be ongoing. The next in your toolbox is to create that daily checklist. Um, a daily checklist and um, thinking about this at length, you could have a daily checklist that at morning huddle, your stand-up safety huddle, um, what, whatever your organization calls it, but your morning huddle, you may have um, a certain list of uh, for daily checklist that you have assigned to each member of your huddle. Something that they could do in for that day, maybe after huddle in 15, 20, 30 minutes at the max. Um, so maybe in these different areas of medications, your nutrition area, the dirty and clean utility rooms, patient rooms, medical records, um, equipment maintenance, your egresses, which really important, warmers, refrigerators, and then um, documentation audits. So as an example, um, you could assign medications to a team member at, at Huddle. So these things we would want them to check. Make sure that the med room is locked if there's no one in there. Make sure that you check that medication refrigerator and that the thermometer is set appropriate, that it, it is set appropriately. That the refrigerator logs are complete. And if the refrigerator temperature has been out of range, that that's documented. That the medications there in your med room are secure. There are no medications left unattended. That if you do have multi-dose files that they're dated with the expiration dates and that you don't have any open single dose files, um, that your pill cutters um, and any of your mortal pestles are all clean. You don't have any unwrapped IV fluids. Um, just something on your list that each person can be responsible for. Um, and this of course grows and changes as we do this and that way you're using your huddle members to help to go out and check these things. It's usually best, and it's um, interesting too that this helps a great deal with tracers, is don't give people the, um, the, the same area over and over again. Um, give them new things. We all learn when we're checking um, different areas 
of the organization as well. And then the next and last is design and print a pocket guide. Um, it's wonderful for our staff members and at my former organization, we were always given um, updated pocket guides about every two years. And these included um, things like our mission, vision, values. It had information about um, staffing. Um, it had information about the unacceptable abbreviations, all types of information about medication management, all of our emergency codes, um, anything on environmental safety we want to make sure that our staff have at their fingertips. What are your fire safety codes and different information about that? Um, informa uh, infection prevention, our quality measures, what about our QAPI, um, different information on patient safety, patient's rights, HIPAA, um, advanced directives, and then a list of potential survey questions, things that you um, may come up with or in the past you've heard about the things that surveyors are asking. So our um, staff members have that at their fingertips to refer to and to review, especially when they've been told that the surveyors are in the in the building. But it's something that they can continue to review and learn from. Um, it's really good to have something like that as well. And lastly, uh, quote I love from Benjamin Franklin, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And that's certainly true. So to maintain your survey readiness, we need to um, take care of um, uh, continuous um, survey readiness on a daily basis um, to make sure that we're always prepared. We never know when surveyors may um, enter our doors. We have a list of a few resources um, for you guys here as well. And then we have plenty of time for some um, questions um, or comments. And then I will open it up. Do we have any questions in our chat or something that's being? So Carla, there is one question in our chat and it, says, okay. it asks, I have a lot of new managers within our hospital who have gone through or have not gone through the survey before. How would you prepare them um, for survey readiness? Okay. Um, well, first, um, a lot of training. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't train just when we're preparing for survey. So we should begin our training um, in orientation um, to prepare for survey. We should have the um, new, if you have new managers, um, buddied up with a um, a senior manager who's been through survey before and who has that comfort level. Um, make sure that they um, understand uh, the COPs, you know, that they are um, um, on top of their policies and procedures, you know, giving them a checklist specific to their department. But helping them buddy up with another manager who's been through this is really an important thing as well. But again, our orientation um, should start with how we uh, prepare for survey um, and we should do, you know, your annual competencies uh, validations that you have. That's another great opportunity to talk about um, survey preparation and conditions of participation and so forth. And a lot of your staff meetings and managers meetings. Um, this is not something that just should come up at the very, you know, at the very last minute, just because you're in your survey window. Okay. Uh, we do have another question. Um, this is from Crystal, and she says, I would like uh, information about egress regulations. We have a basement under our clinic that is used for staff breaks, um, no patient care. How many excess does the basement require? And mm. do you have to have two to meet the fire code. The windows are not an option for an exit. Okay. Um, Crystal, let me go back and do some checking on that because I want to make sure there are a lot of different, um, um, there are egress specifics, but there are also different um, fire 
code um, regulations based on states and based on um, even counties um, and the age of your building. So um, if you could possibly type your information, if you would, into our chat and we will get back with you specifically on that. And thank you for the question. Um, so the next question um, that we have here is um, we currently are having um, entirely rebuild of our quality program from scratch, including policies and procedures. If a survey was to come on site today, how would, oops, I gotta expand that a little bit so I can see. How would we approach this with them? Well, you're not alone. We do hear throughout our work um, across the country, there is always a lot of turnover. Um, and, and yet, you know, and sometimes that historical knowledge goes out the window or out the door with the person or people who have left. Um, so, you know, what I typically um, tell hospitals is have a plan. You know, surveyors, um, most of the surveyors understand uh, changes in personnel. And um, in many cases, I've even heard stories of the entire uh, policy or plans or different things that have been working on have just disappeared. So surveyors uh, do understand change of personnel and that you may find yourself um, at, at a real loss. So start your planning, develop your, your, um, your program, start from a, um, a scratch, create a Gantt chart, develop action plans, have a plan, have something to show them. If they enter your building and they ask these questions that, hey, up front, this is what's happened and this is what we're doing. I remember a, um, a mock survey that I did um, where a hospital had had a real issue with, um, with barcode scanning. And so they just kind of said, okay, well, it's not working. Let's put it to the side. But, you know, rarely is a surveyor going to just accept that. So what we worked on with them was to develop an action plan. We know that the barcode scanning situ system wasn't working appropriately. Um, what are we doing about it? creating that plan. And sure enough, the surveyor came in about two months later and they had a plan and they asked and they had a plan and the surveyor was fine with that. It was having a plan to create that, uh, to um, correct that situation. So as long as we acknowledge that there is an issue and that we are addressing it, um, I think that is the best that we can do. Yep, I agree. Um, so the next question is if we are, cited on a survey, what would be the best first steps on implementing a plan of correction? Um, I think the first thing that you should do is to develop your team. And I don't mean just leadership. I mean, the staff members that are directly related to this particular deficiency. Um, our staff know um, how the issues arise, and they are very uh, capable of helping us develop a plan to correct the issues. So developing your team, have your team um, that are related to that specific deficiency, work on that plan of correction. And then we need to make sure that the 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 plan is um, the plan is well known. Our plan of correction is well known, and we need to make sure that we audit that. That we have the action plan. That we're monitoring the um, implementation of that action plan, and that we have the documentation mm -hmm. on that monitoring of that action plan as well. Yeah, so they can see the progress of where you're at Abs with that. Absolutely. Yep. Um, well, we have another question here. Um, what is the common ways to prepare for survey? So if you don't mind, Carla, I feel like you've answered, answered a lot of questions. I'll answer this one. Absolutely. Um, I think Carla would agree training, training and training and even more training <laughs> for your staff. Um, oftentimes um, we wait. Um, I, you know, as chief nursing officer, I was one of those that scurried when I was in the in the window of survey and definitely not something to recommend because that often leaves you very vulnerable. 
And so you wanna make sure that you're including um, survey readiness in your orientation, um, touching some of those um, in your staff meetings. You don't wanna overload them on information in staff meetings, but having you know, touches of information throughout your staff meetings would be greatly helpful. Including that in your annual competencies with your staff um, and making sure that you're, you're getting them um, in, involved in the tracers. So if you're doing tracers to um, stay compliant with being survey ready, get the staff involved in with that. You know, giving them little snippets of survey readiness over a course of time um, is, is so much easier to soak in as a nurse because they're so busy anyway, but it allows you to get more information out there. And so the more times you're hitting survey ready, the easier it is for them to retain that information. Um, when it comes to being prepared, just don't wait. You know, it's never a good thing to wait when you're in your window. It just causes you more work in the long run. Absolutely. Um, All right. I am not seeing any yeah. further questions. Okay. All right. Well, we really, really do appreciate you guys joining us today um, for the um for the survey readiness and building your toolbox. And um, we hope that you also will. Um, look at this, um, the link, the site that, that Keith added so that you can see the um, dashboard. Um, and of course, we'll make updates and changes to that as they come about. If you have any questions um, for us, please do not hesitate to reach out to any uh, one of the Strawwater consultants. We're always here to help you. Um, and if we don't happen to know the answer, we'll find it for you. Um, and also, I want to remind you at the end of this, um, at this webinar, we do have a survey and we would appreciate the time that you can give us to fill out the survey to let us know how we're doing so we can better improve. Thank you all for Thank joining you. us. Thank you so much, Carla and Christy and Keith. Um, and to everyone who joined us today, we're so happy to have you with us. And um, as Carla said, please, do um, take a minute to, to fill out the survey that pops up at the end. We really value your feedback and we're continuously wanting to improve everything that we offer you. So um, the survey is very quick and uh, we, we really value your time and feedback. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you guys.